Good to be here this morning. Last week, we asked the question, what if we engaged in this thing called forgiveness? Uh, as we thought about the fact that when we come to faith in Jesus and we receive forgiveness, we get unstuck. But we're then given the challenge to be bottomless suppliers of forgiveness to other people. Because if we don't forgive others, we end up getting stuck. Well, today we ask another question. We ask, what if we engaged in this thing that is central to our faith? This thing that helps us navigate life and grow in our relationship with God. Today we ask the question, what if we engaged in a life of prayer? When it comes to prayer, the easiest thing in the world is for the preacher to stand up and make us all feel guilty because we all know that we fall short in this area, that all of us could pray more fully than what we actually do. And actually, I suppose guilt is a motivator to an extent. We've all got those New Year's resolutions that are born out of guilt, but the problem is guilt lasts for a short while, doesn't it? It takes us through to about February or March, and then we're done. There's a better motivator than guilt, and the better motivator than guilt is grace. And that's where I want to start today. We're thinking about prayer. I'm going to start off broad, and then we're going to make our way to our psalm this morning. And we're actually going to look at the first three verses of the psalm, but we're going to look at this psalm in total this week and next week. So rather than think about prayer and being driven by guilt, I want us to be driven by grace. And grace says, God is giving us that which we do not deserve. Here's the good news. The gift of prayer isn't predicated upon your performance. You might have prayed badly over the last year or over the last month, but the opportunity and the invitation to pray is open to you today, right now, and into the future. So we want to think about grace. We want to think about prayer as a gift of grace. Isn't it true that we've got things in our lives that, that are wonderful gifts, that are great things, but often, because we're so familiar with them, we take them for granted. Perhaps that view from your living room window, that painting in your house, whatever it might be. And sometimes it's just helpful when someone reminds you of the value of the gift you have. And that's what's really nice about doing the swap with Casey, is we're swapping stories and he's reminding me of the wonderful locks, of the lovely Isle of Arran and some of these different places that he's been visiting that so often we can take for granted. And I'm able to do the same with Casey as well. And, and that's the case with prayer, that perhaps you've been of the faith for years and it is easy for us to take this gift of prayer for granted. So I want us to be re reminded this morning of the wonder of the gift of prayer. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, something very powerful happened, and it was a symbolic thing. And here's what happened was the temple curtain ripped from top to bottom. And this is something really huge and really powerful, that no longer do we need to go to a particular place, get a particular person, the priest, to go through into the Holy of Holies to access God. But now the temple curtain is torn in two because of Jesus, and we can pray and call out to God, come into his presence through faith in Jesus, anytime, any place, anywhere. And that is the gift of prayer. So on one hand, I want us to think of it as this wonderful gift that we've received, that we can speak to our Heavenly Father. I also, on the other hand, want us to see and be reminded of the essential need that we have for prayer. Because when we come to faith, what happens is we do step in to a battleground. The Bible tells us we've got an enemy, the devil. He roams around like a lion looking to devour his prey. Here's what lions do when they get hold of their prey, they, they cut off the throat to ensure that there's no air supply. Prayer is the air supply to the Christian. It's a battlefield. So don't be surprised when you sit down to pray and the phone rings. Don't be surprised when you sit down to pray and you start thinking about your shopping, what you're going to have for your lunch and your dinner. It is a spiritual battleground. It was Martin Luther who said, I I'm so busy today. That I'm going to have to spend the first three hours in prayer. Now, we don't often jump to three hours of prayer, but if we can start small, then we can build and grow just like physical exercise. Today, I don't think that there's going to be anything new that I'm going to say. I think you'll probably all have heard everything that I'm about to say, but it is good to go back to basics. It was Jack Nicholas, the, the great golfer, 
who could be seen on the practice ground on a Monday or Tuesday after a major championship, and he could be heard saying these words to his coach. Coach, teach me how to play the game of golf. And here's what he's getting at. He's saying there are some fundamental basics that you just have to be reminded of over and over again. And that is exactly the same when it comes to this thing called prayer. That we actually should come humbly like the disciples, come before the Lord and say, Lord, teach us how to pray. So we're going to pull out six points. We'll take three today and three next week from Psalm 5 as we continue in our series. And we ask the question, what if we engaged in this thing called prayer? So reading from Psalm 5 this morning, verses 1 through 3. Listen to my words, O Lord. Attend to my sighing. Listen to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice, in the morning I plead my case to you and watch. This is the word of the Lord. So we're told there in Psalm 5 that this is a morning prayer. So what we've actually got here is it's the morning after the day before. Uh, and the day before, David has had a rough time. There have been some enemies coming after him with their words, probably telling untruths, speaking harsh words, and, and it has vexed him. We, we get the source of that in verse 9, we find that. Uh, and David is stretched and he's vexed, he's been angered. Uh, you know what that's like when you have a problem, you rub up against someone uh, and you go to bed at night and it feels as if there's no solution. You turn it over and over in your mind and you're just not getting anywhere and, and it feels hopeless. But then you wake up the next morning, it's the morning after the day before. Now it's not that the problem's disappeared because it's very much still there, but in the new day, you're kind of given a different perspective. There's a little bit of hope, a little bit of potential in the new day. There's something about the night time that leads us to a sense of hopelessness, but the daytime, the morning time, leads us to a new perspective. So the question is, where do you turn the morning after the day before? There's the story of the Scottish minister who went to visit Jeannie Brune, who was in hospital. So he went to see Junie, and it was over his lunch break, and he hadn't had anything to eat. And Junie was someone who loved to talk. So here she is, she's talking and she's talking, the minister's listening, and he's growing more and more hungry, and as he looks at Jeannie's bedside, there's a, a, a bowl with nuts. So he decides to reach for the nuts, and he takes one, Jeannie's talking, so he just continues eating. She's talking, he's eating, and before he knows where he is, he's demolished the whole bowl of nuts. So he decides to interrupt Jeannie, he says, hey, wait, wait a minute here, I've just got to apologize. Those nuts that were left for you at the side of your bed, I've eaten them all. And she says, didn't he worry about that minister? I don't like nuts, but I do like the chocolate. So I lick the chocolate off and I spat them into the bowl. <laughs> Sometimes in life, we reach for the thing that's before us and it's not necessarily the right thing. We look for the, the, the quick fix, the easy solution, when actually we should reach for the things of God. So, so here's David. The morning after the day before, he's got all power, possession, and position in his hands. But what does he do? He goes to the Lord first. He reaches to God. He purposely pulls in to the pit stop of prayer. Here's an alliteration for you. Purposely prioritizes the pit stop of prayer. That's where he goes. He makes that his focus before he takes any action. So here's our first point today. Pray regularly. So for David, we're told in verse 3, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you. Here's his pattern. He gets up in the morning and he brings his prayers before God. He does that even the, the morning after the day before when things have been really hard. That's his focus. There's something about the morning. When we start off the day in prayer, it reminds us that you don't go into the day ahead on your own. It covers what's about to go before you. Maybe some difficult meetings or some problem people that you're going to come across. You're more prepared when you've gone into it through prayer to respond better. More chance of responding in a godly fashion to the difficulties that come your way. I quoted him last week. I quote him again this week. 
the great late Welsh preacher Selwyn Hughes, he says this, isn't it true a diver who failed to check his airline is working before descending into the depths of the sea would be no more foolish than the Christian who goes out into the day without the breathing apparatus of prayer connected. We see it with Jesus, don't we? Up at the crack of dawn, in isolation, praying to the Heavenly Father. There's something about the morning. But equally, I get it, maybe for some of you that doesn't work. Maybe you are looking after someone who's sick. Maybe you've got children running around the house. Maybe there are other things that press you. Well, if it's not the morning, maybe it's lunchtime. Maybe it's nighttime where you can just find that moment of peace and focus. Now, we can also pray as we're on the move. We're going between meetings. Yes, we can do that. But we're going to see in it from our message today when we get to the third point, there's something about having a time where you can sit down and focus your heart on prayer. So first of all, we see David prays regularly. Secondly, he prays humbly. So when we pray, there's a call here for us to remember who it is we're talking to. I came across this really challenging quote from a guy called R.A. Torrey. Here's what he says. Very much of so-called prayer, both public and private, is not unto God. In order that a prayer should be really unto God, there must be a definite and conscious approach to God when we pray. We must have a definite and vivid realization that God is bending over us and listening as we pray. Now, we, we see this from David in this psalm. So verse one, he refers to God, the personal name Yahweh the Lord, Verse 2, he says, hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. It's almost like he is focusing, he's channeling himself and his focus in on who God is, the one to whom he prays. Now, it's really significant that he uses the word king, because he, here's David, and, and he is the king at a time in the Israelite history when monarchy was really important. The people looked to David. He's the one from their point of view, who provides stability, order, and protection. But it's clear that as David wakes up in that morning and there's problems, he doesn't go to power, position, or possessions. He goes to God first. He knows that ultimately he's not the king. God is the king. That God's the one who provides stability, order, and protection. Not ultimately David. And maybe we need to be reminded of that in our lives as well. There might be places in your life where you, you've got a position of responsibility, but you're not king. You, you're not actually ultimately king of your family, in your office, or in your community group. You're not the king because ultimately it's God who is king. Maybe we need to be reminded of that in terms of how we pray. Sometimes do we adopt the position of king and we see God as our servant who can do our errands for us as we bark commands at him? Perhaps we need to readdress that and remember that we're the servants and he's the king. Maybe from a practical point of view, it might be helpful for us to pause before we pray, to just remind ourselves what we're doing as we engage in prayer. To remind ourselves, I'm not th talking to thin air, I'm talking to the living God. I'm not talking to someone who's far away, I'm talking to someone who is immediately present. I'm not talking to someone who doesn't know me, I'm talking to my heavenly Father who created me. David recognizes that he isn't the ultimate king, it's God. And despite everything that he has at his fingertips, he knows that the priority as he gets up on that morning, the morning after the day before, is to call out to God, the ultimate king, utilizing this gift of grace, which we call prayer. Now, we're going to pause there before we come to our third point. And you sang it very well last week without words. So we've got words this week. So we thought we would do it again. As I said, this is a favorite at Avondale Church where I minister in Scotland. So we thought we would sing this one again. A 
I've got a total frog in my throat today, so uh, I'll, I'll just help to lead you a bit. But, um. <clears throat> Do you want to stand? Yeah, you've been sitting for a while, so you can... If you, if you want to sit, you can sit. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we've seen the call to pray regularly, perhaps the morning, pray humbly, uh, and thirdly, pray wholeheartedly. This idea of bringing it all before the Lord. So just before I get to the kind of content of the wholeheartedness bit, just want us to see his approach. Verse 3, he says, I lay my requests before you. Now, the, the word that's used there to lay is interesting the verb there is, means to set out in order. And it's the same word that's used to describe how the priest set out the bread, the showbread, in the tabernacle. 
So it might be a little bit like you guys setting out your Christmas decorations. You've got particular places where things go and you like it to be in a kind of semblance of order. So this is interesting. Here's David the morning after the day before, and what we're being told is he brings his prayers in a semblance of order before God. This isn't scattergun. This is very deliberate. So what does this mean for us? This isn't saying you can't pray in those times of trouble where you just fire up a prayer. You know, we're, we should do that. When trouble comes our way, when we're in that really difficult meeting, fire the prayer up. And there's not much order to it. We're just saying, Lord, help me. But it's the morning after the day before. Here he is, and it's his time of focus, and he's thought through the issues. Maybe I didn't react so well there. I need help with that. That person really lost it there. Could you help them? And he's thinking it through. And, and maybe that's something that we would do well to do as well. And I, and I don't know how you do that. For some of you, maybe you could do that naturally. For others of us, maybe it means getting a pen and paper and thinking through, here's issue A, Lord, could you work in that area and in this place and in that person? Maybe it's the call for some of us today to maybe start thinking about a, a prayer journal where we can write things down and bring them before God. So he lays his prayers in order after a really difficult time. What are the, what's the content? What does he bring before God? What, what, what does this mean to bring wholehearted prayer? Well, we see this actually in verse one. I'm just looking at the translation that we had. The words that I had in my Bible were slightly different. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament is what I had in my in version and hear my cry for help. This is wholehearted prayer. It was Spurgeon who said, everyone prays, but few cry to the Lord. So, so here he is, he's bringing tears. He brings laments or murmurings of the soul. So it's tears and there's something deeper going on here. So I just want to put those two things together. This is interesting. He, he brings orderly prayer before God, but notice this, it's not emotionless. This isn't some kind of business approach to prayer. Yes, he has order, but he also brings a full set of emotions with it. He's bringing tears, and he's bringing what he's calling the murmurings of his soul, these lamentations as well. I don't know if you've watched any of these sporting documentaries on the television. They're quite a big thing in the United Kingdom, following soccer teams or, or rugby teams, and one of the themes that comes through from the ones that I've watched is it's the coach speaking to the team before they go out on the pitch. And here's what the coach is saying over and over again. I want you to leave it all out on the pitch. I don't want you coming in here ready to run a mile at the end of the game. I want you to come in here exhausted. I don't want you coming in here at the end of the game cracking jokes. I want you to be physically and mentally completely done because you've left it all out on the pitch, all out on the field. Well, there's a sense in which that's what David does here in prayer. He's bringing it all before God. Ever had that experience where there's something painful in your life that's taken place and you, you meet with a close friend and you talk and you talk and you keep talking, but there does come a point after having talked a lot that there's just no more words. You've, you've shared what you can. There, there's no more words but the pain's still there. So, so the words are done, but the pain that you're experiencing is still there. And there's a sense of what David is saying is, Lord, attend to my words, but also attend to that deeper murmuring that I cannot put words to. David's praying, he's bringing words, he's bringing tears, and he's bringing those achings of the soul that we can't quite put into words. He's fully engaged. He's leaving it all out on the pitch before the Lord. Challenge. When was the last time you prayed like that? Comfort. Isn't it wonderful to know that we are invited to pray like that? That prayer isn't some emotionless thing where we recite theological terminology that we don't really understand. That's not what we're called to do. 
We're invited to bring it all before God, our words, our tears, the achings of our soul that we can't put into words. We can bring it all before him. And what a comfort that is, that this prayer thing is real. What we get a sense of here as I come to a close, a sense of prayer being dynamic, real, kind of interactive, this is exciting, but I also recognize that we aren't always going to feel that way about prayer, that there are going to be times that maybe some of you are in those today that we might describe as walking through the wilderness. It is pretty difficult to engage in prayer. And if that's you today, I just want to take us back to where we began. Remember, prayer is a gift of grace. Remember also that it is oxygen to the lungs of the Christian, that prayer is the lifeline. So learning here from David, pray regularly, pray humbly, and pray wholeheartedly.